Good afternoon, everyone, um, or good morning, depending on what time zone you happen to be in. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, Executive Understanding of Cybersecurity uh, with Artelis President Michael Specka. Uh, Michael has more than 20 years of experience delivering IT services and business operations expertise. Um, and one of the unique things about Artelis is that we bring together experts in both cyber operations and business operations with the goal of replacing uncertainty around cybersecurity needs and best practices with an understanding of how a mature cyber program doesn't just meet compliance requirements, um, but also protects your business interests and allows your business the opportunity to expand and withstand successfully in an increasingly vulnerable cyber environment. Um, so that is kind of what we're here to talk about today. We're gonna to talk about some common mis mis misconceptions um, around cybersecurity uh how to get started do a program or uh, an overview of what a, a mature cyber program looks like and then we will be taking some questions at the end um so as a couple of admin notes uh, we will be monitoring the q a section um we will try to get to everybody's questions if for some reason we don't we will answer them in a follow-on email and additionally we are recording this session and we'll make that recording available after the event um and so with that i'm going to go ahead and turn it over to michael Thanks, Jess. Um, like uh, Jessica said, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. A um, little bit about uh, the content that we're uh, about to talk about. This is absolutely an introductory session. Um, so please uh, ask questions. Um, please assume that the, uh, the other members in the audience uh, probably have similar questions to the questions that you have. Uh, a little bit about what this presentation is not. This is not a technical presentation. Uh, we're not going to be talking about different cybersecurity techniques. Um, we're not going to be talking about adversary behaviors. Um, our goal here is really to give you a bit of a vocabulary and uh, a bit of an understanding of what a cybersecurity program looks like so that you can uh, choose uh, vendors to help you with your own cybersecurity program and know what to expect uh, from the folks in your organization. And so I want to start out with some myths um, that help ground people uh, in the right thinking, to help uh, ground people in the right thinking. So the first myth um, that I've certainly learned about as I've been involved more in the cybersecurity space is this idea that we are uh, either secure or insecure. Um, and a lot of things you can learn about cybersecurity and how you should be approaching managing cybersecurity. Uh, really, you can think about physical security. Right. And if you think about physical security, there's increasingly complex ways that we could protect a physical space. Um, so uh, we could have a, a house, let's say, or a building, and we could put locks on the doors. Well, those locks uh, don't do much against a, a battering ram or, or a lock pick. Um, we could then add an alarm system to that uh, house. So if the door opens up, uh, an alarm triggers and then you know people could respond well depending on who's coming through the door people may or may not be able to deal with whatever's coming through the door so we could put a monitor on that alarm and that monitor could summon uh, the police um, oh, the police might not get there in time so we could add guards to the building and those guards could uh, provide more immediate security but those guards might not have the right um weaponry to deal with the attack and so on and so forth. And so when you're thinking about cybersecurity, people get hung up on this idea that they can achieve a state, a fixed state of security. Um, and just like any other contest, um, any other conflict, which is what cybersecurity is about, it, it's got everything to do with the threat, with what the adversary, with what the person who's trying to defeat your defenses brings to the table. And so um, to ask your cybersecurity provider or your cybersecurity uh, or IT resources, you know, make me secure, really um, oversimplifies the problem and lays out uh, an impossible goal for, for people to achieve. It also lays out an impossible standard for you to try to manage to. Um, so rather than thinking about are we secure, are we not secure, uh, there's a variety of programs uh, and models out on the market. Uh, the most recent one that's gotten a lot of attention is the cybersecurity um, maturity certification uh, that's uh, sponsored by the Defense Department. 
um, and they lay out different levels of you know potential security posture and a way to continuously mature that security over time so rule number one don't think about it in terms of security or or or, or not secure uh, but think about it in terms of as a as a business executive what do i need to know about my organization to understand where we're strong and where we're weak where we could improve uh, and where we have uh, good positioning and what kind of threat what kind of adversary am I uh, going to be able to respond to? So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, everybody has seen the movie where, uh, you know, someone looks up from their computer and they say, I'm in, I'm in, and now I can do whatever I want. And that is not how hacks work. Um, so the idea that you are safe or you are hacked is another myth, uh, another duality. The fact of the matter is, is that um, there's a, a, a documented what uh, I, uh, security professionals refer to as kill chain. There's a there's a documented set of steps that an, an, an attacker needs to use to get into your network and then do something valuable with with that penetration. And there's various levels of kinds of attacks. The most sophisticated threat actors, nation state threat actors, the kinds that are most often in the news or certainly in the news right now. Um, their goal is actually to extract information quietly from a network. They're not interested in uh, defacing your website. For example, what they want to do is lurk inside that network for as long as possible to gather as much information as they can um, about your organization or more likely, uh, if you're a smaller business, about the organizations that you serve. So they're uh, it's called a su supply chain compromise, and they're trying to learn more about somebody else by getting into your network. Less sophisticated actors, um, vandals, let's say, might just want to embarrass you by doing things to your website. And then criminals often, if they're not trying to steal data like financial data, they're interested in what you know, we've all read about is ransomware attacks. So how can they take your information away from you and make you... Uh, uh, pay to get it back. But in order to do any of those things, uh, you have to get through a layer of defenses and then you have to find the information that you're looking for and extract it from your network and cybersecurity firms, uh, organizations, including your own, if you have an internal cybersecurity team that, or you're trying to set up an internal cybersecurity team, should be looking for indicators that adversaries are active in your network and um, looking for indications that an adversary is trying to attack your network. Because again, you're not safe or hacked, you're on this continuum. And to really be able to have an organization that can deal with cyber risk, you need to build an organization that can survive uh, an attack because there's probably one coming at some point. And like all risks, you're, you're trying to decrease the likelihood that the risk occurs and you're trying to increase the likelihood that as an organization you can survive the risk um, if it in fact happens. So we want to think about this as a, as, a, as a scale both in terms of where we are in our security and we want to think about it in terms of a scale when we're thinking about where we are in terms of compromises, having been compromised. Uh, the last three items that we want to talk about here are really about um, uh, continuity. So before we're talking about scales, now we're talk, talk a little bit about continuity. So an, another thing that you're not going to be when it comes to cybersecurity is done. You don't implement it and then it's over. So a lot of organizations that are trying to sell cybersecurity tools uh, will talk about uh, implementing that tool and now I've implemented it, and so therefore my security, which I, I know to think about now on a spectrum, my security is higher. Um, but oftentimes these tools require constant use. Um, again, cybersecurity is a contest. Uh, things that one of the things cybersecurity professionals like to say is that the adversary gets a vote in what's happening, right? The person you're up again gets a vote in what's happening. And so uh, it's not like you buy something, you turn it on, and then it works, and it's done. 
Um, certainly that are there are plenty of tools that you can buy turn on and they can do things to make your organization more secure and they can do things to make it more likely that in the event that you get attacked you're going to survive that attack uh, but those activities aren't um, set and forget activities and there's a need to continuously mature the posture that you take to increase your security in light of the fact that things change so if you're trying to manage a cybersecurity team, again, whether that's vendors or your own folks, uh, and trying to understand how as a business leader you should be thinking about cybersecurity, think about something that requires continuous management. It, much like the competition that you have to, to deal with uh, on the economic side, the legal side of your business, uh, how are we performing against our competitors? You also need to think about how we're dynamically managing uh, the risks that we face. And so don't think we're going to turn on our security stuff, we're going to be secure, and we're going to be safe. Think about what capabilities do we have, how are they being used, and how are they being improved. Despite all of this, this doesn't necessarily have to be complex, and it doesn't necessarily have to be unattainable. I've spent the past two or three years now learning an awful lot about cybersecurity, uh, like Jess mentioned, I come from the business operations uh, side of things. Before getting into cybersecurity, I uh, help companies implement customer relationship management systems. So uh, as far really from questions of cybersecurity as, as you can get, you know, these were sales and marketing questions that we were uh, attempting to answer. And I've learned a lot uh, in the last couple of years about uh, what cybersecurity is and how to implement and how to manage it. And it does sound difficult, and like many technology questions, especially emerging technology questions, uh, it seems like something that you have to be a technology expert to understand. And like any other thing that you manage, uh, that is not the case. You don't have to be an expert in all of the terms and, and uh, all of the latest state-of-the-art stuff to be able to understand how to, how to have a conversation with a provider and manage performance for cybersecurity. So, what I'd like to do uh, next is, uh, unless just there's any questions coming in over the, the wire, is just take a, a publicly available framework that we've tweaked a little bit uh, here at Artlist uh, and talk through what the activities are that you need to be able to do to have a sophisticated, mature cybersecurity program. So any questions so far? Not so far. All right, great. I'll go ahead then with uh, this view. So this picture, this continuous process on the left um, comes from the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, NIST. A lot of um, cybersecurity standards uh, that are out in the market are based on or incorporate or think about compliance with various NIST standards. And what you're looking at at the left from identify around and recover is the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, because of that need to continuously evolve uh, and continuously mature your cybersecurity posture, here at our list, we've added a sixth activity. Um, but again, from a management standpoint, understanding what it is that uh, you need to do as a business leader, um, we've got six items for you to think about. Uh, and these are to identify, protect, detect, respond, recover, and evolve. So let's go through these uh, at a little bit slower rate. Identification. So what is it that we need to identify as a, a, as a business leader or as an IT leader when we're thinking about implementing cybersecurity? So the easy thing to think about here is counting equipment. How many computers do I have out there? How many... Um, firewalls do I have out there? How many offices do I have? And how are those offices connected to the internet? How many employees are out there? Um, so, so there's definitely a, a need inside this identify activity to count stuff. Um, what you want to do as a leader is go beyond counting stuff and identify your risks and how your risks align with your business strategy. Um, I'll give you an example about how this thing could be different from uh, organization to organization based on some companies we've helped implement cybersecurity programs. Um, one of our customers uh, is a, a global operation. They're a small business, but they deploy resources all over the world to execute 
on their mission and to provide value to their customers. Um, even before uh, COVID and before the changes that many of us had to go through uh, with the pandemic, they were always thinking about how to provide computing resources globally. They had employees that worked in lots of different places for the number of employees they have. Uh, they've got a pretty high number of offices. Um, and so when they think about enabling their business operations from an IT perspective and therefore a risk perspective, they need to be able to maintain that globally available presence. They need to be able to work from all over the world. And so the risks associated with operating all over the world, frequent travel, connecting from environments that they don't control, um, is one set of risks, right? And so in terms of identifying what they need to have a successful cybersecurity program, they need to identify the, the desire to be globally available and the risks that come with global availability. On the opposite side of the spectrum, we have a customer that uh, is a manufacturer and they uh, have a very defined physical space where they work. Um, the pandemic has, of course, uh, forced changes, but they are eager to see the pandemic resolve and for their employees to come back uh, into their offices. And a big part of the risk that they've been managing through the pandemic um, isn't about people uh, working remotely, although, of course, they've had to deal with that like, like all of us have. Um, but they're also trying to figure out how to safely get workers back into their space. And so the risks that uh, are associated with that organization have everything to do with protecting the four walls of where they work and protecting the equipment that's inside their space. So rather than worrying about scattering, they're worried about concentration. The risks that they have to manage are, if someone gets in, where can they go? How can I keep them from getting into everything? As opposed to how can I make sure you can get to my data from anywhere in the previous example. So yes, you need to count things, your, your folks, your team, your vendors, uh, they need to be able to identify all the systems out there and they need to be able to identify um, all the computing needs that everybody has and, and make sure that they've got the right counts and the things that they're counting have the right protections on them. From a program level, you need to be thinking about what are the risks that I face? And how can we as an organization protect against those risks? And how can I direct my team to think more broadly than counting computers and understand the business capabilities that we're trying to enable and how do we protect those business capabilities? So that's what you need to do underneath Identify. The protection, which is what comes next, is a little bit more like you what you would predict. As long as you're thinking about protection as a continuum, not it's secure or it's insecure, and those are two binary states, but there's a number of things that we can do to make it harder to attack us. Think back to that, um, that physical security space and the history of security around, uh, <clears throat> around physical spaces. I could build a moat, I could build a wall, <clears throat> right, my attacker could bring a, uh, you know, a longer bridge or a taller ladder to, to my space. <clears throat> so what are the appropriate protections? And understand that those protections change over time. And so you're going to want your team or your vendors to be uh, concerned about keeping abreast of what threats are out in the environment. For your industry, what kinds of organizations are going to attack you? Uh, and how do I minimize the chance of those attacks to succeed? Because there's an infinite number of things you could potentially do to create protections. And uh, like you know, most leadership decisions, one, you have to make sure that your people are looking at the right things. And two, you're going to need to make resource trade-offs. So am I spending my budget that I'm using for my information technology um, capabilities and the protection of those capabilities are, am I spending my budget in the right way? And of course, there's no silver bullets, even though some vendors uh, in our market like to say that, that they've got everything covered. Um, you're going to need to make trade-off decisions. And so when you're trying to understand the trade-offs that you need to make, when your team or your vendor is recommending that you invest in different uh, types of protection, 
you're going to have protection that you need to put put in place because it meets regulatory requirements. There's models out there. We talk, we're talking about a NIST model right here. NIST has a framework uh, called Special Publication 800171. Has a whole list of 110 things that you need to do, many of which are protections that you need to implement. And so, because you're following those regulations, you've got to do it. Um, the second thing you want to ask about the protection investments that you're making, though, is what specific risk am I trying to manage with this technique, with, with this investment? And do those add up to the bigger risks that I identified during the phase before? So in other words, am I spending my dollars on, my, on the most important things? Um, protection uh, is something that you can implement, going back to that earlier uh, uh, set of myths. So I can turn on different kinds of protections, uh, but many protections uh, also uh, limit the ability to do certain things. So let's take an example of removable media, USB sticks, uh, memory on USB sticks. A lot of organizations say that those are pretty risky devices. That's a great way to uh, inject and spread malware inside an organization. So you're probably going to, if you're following certain frameworks that are out there, you're going to say we, we can't use them unless I say we can use them. And if I say we can use them, then they have to be encrypted. So now you've got a process to manage. Um, so if you're following the NIST framework, for example, you'll say we're not going to use them except in ways that I say we can. And then when I say we can use them as, the, as a business leader uh, or I have to issue an exemption because that, that method, that tool is really the best way to get something done. We'll know who has it. Have someone be accountable for it. Don't make it generic. So now I've got a business process, right? A business process that you as a business leader will recognize like any other business process. There's nothing super special or complex about a property log, right? The idea that I got a thing, I need to know who has it, I need to know what they're doing with it. So that is an, a common protection activity that you're gonna wanna manage like you would any other business process. Um, once you put all your protections in place, we still need to look for the bad guy. Um, we need to be able to see if our protections or the detection capability that we put inside our networks uh, are showing us that something uh, is going on that shouldn't be going on. So that's what that detection part of the process is all about. Um, so I've done some good governance. I've identified where my risks are. I, I understand what I'm worried about. I've set up my uh, infrastructure to make it hard for the things that I'm worried about to happen, but they still could. And now I'm watching for those bad things to happen. Remember we talked about uh, a hack as a series of events. It's not the person in the hoodie uh, in the movie looking up and saying I'm in. It's a, a, a set of activities that get people closer and closer to their goal, people who are trying to break into your your network or compromise your resources. So there's things that your vendors or your team can do to witness that activity happening and put a stop to it. And so that is what you want your detection uh, dollars and your detection capabilities going to. So how do you manage this? Again, it looks a lot like other business processes. I'm now looking for a certain risk and I've got indicators of that risk. Uh, expect your team or your vendors to educate you about the kinds of things that they're looking for. And then how often are they telling you that they've looked? What are they telling you that they've seen? Because they're probably going to see some things. And when they see some things or they are able to figure out whether or not that thing is a bad thing or a normal thing. So let's talk about an example from a, uh, the perspective of our client that needs people to be all over the world. One of the protections you can put in place is to find out where people are connecting from uh, when they're connecting to your network. If you're the, the type of organization that doesn't go anywhere and someone's trying to log in from Germany or uh, Iran um, or Japan, uh, then that's probably something bad right off the bat. So detecting that login from somewhere else and uh, having your team tell you, well, someone tried to, to log in from a foreign country and we stopped it. Um, that's a basic level of detection reporting that you should expect to see. And again, you need this list. Your team should be able to give you this list of things we're looking for. Um, 
At a different level, if you're the type of organization that needs to be everywhere or does have people that travel all over the place, then a question's asked. Hey, um, we detected a login from a place that we weren't expecting one. Is that okay? Oh yeah, it turns out that we have a team that is traveling, that is in a different country. And so that login is perfectly normal. So as a manager, you're gonna be looking for activities and reporting on those activities from your detection teams. Um, we didn't see anything significant is a, is a perfectly uh, reasonable answer uh, that ideally happens more often than not, uh, but it's not necessarily something that should be happening uh, all the time. So we figured out what we should be worried about. We put some protections around it. We're watching it to make sure that nothing bad is happening. We see that something bad has happened. What are we going to do? A good response plan is an important part of your cybersecurity program. Most standards around, uh, around what these programs should look like, including this one, uh, require you to have a good response plan because in the midst of all the confusion, um, it's really good to have a set of steps that you're gonna follow. So have a good response plan. Most good response plans <clears throat> include legal counsel. One thing I've learned over the last couple of years going to different cybersecurity events, whether they're put on by vendors, or uh, industry associations or nonprofit organizations, public sector, private sector, every seminar I've attended on response, step one or two in your response plan is call your lawyer. Have an attorney that understands uh, the laws around cyber risk because what you call things uh, and what they are and what your obligations are to your clients and what your obligations are to the government and what your contracts say matter a lot when you're responding. The second thing that matters a lot when you're responding is not panicking because a lot of times these sensors detect something that you want to ask a question about, but it turns out to the answer to that question is everything's fine. Um, the, the thing that happened was anomalous. People didn't necessarily follow proper procedures and let us know that it was going to happen or um, the, the, the alarm system worked and we did what we were supposed to when an alarm system worked, which is that we looked. And when we looked, we didn't see anything uh, too awful happening. So the issue has been, been dealt with. Um, the attacker didn't get far and we were able to prevent them from really compromising anything. So we don't really have an incident on our hands. Um, the, the login that came from a foreign country actually makes perfect sense because we're sharing information with a partner uh, in a foreign country that's helping us with, let's say, a, a, you know, a, a manufacturing issue. They're part of our supply chain. So um, stay calm, have a process, and uh, your teams ought to be able to deal with the issue. And then know in that response plan, and again, this is the perfect um, type of management decision that you should expect to make, when it's time to call for help. When do we call the FBI? When do we have to let customers know? If we provide services to the government, when are we obligated to let the government know? And that's where uh, the right legal counsel can help you out. All right, we're almost our, uh, our way, all the way around our, our cyber event here. So something has happened. Uh, we've dealt with it. We've responded to the issue. And now as an organization, we need to recover. So again, like any risks that you manage, the recovery plan from a cyber event, which may have just happened because something broke uh, and not necessarily that because someone was trying to do something bad to you, uh, looks like any other recovery plan. What facilities, what capabilities, what technology do I need to continue operations? And if some of that has been compromised, how do I replace it? And so you won't be surprised to hear that good tested backups are a pretty common uh, component of a recovery plan. Can I bring my manufacturing uh, lines back up after they go down? Do I have uh, backups of the data that I need to be able to serve my customers if my organization primarily does knowledge work? And can I restore those backups quickly? Um, so from a business perspective, the question to ask is, well, if these are the critical activities of my business, what happens if they if they go away? What happens if they're compromised? And how can I get back to a state where I'm doing business again? That is absolutely not an unattainable thing 
that you, that you need a bunch of you know technical jargon uh, to understand you need to understand what you can't absolutely can't afford to lose and how much it's going to cost to make sure that if that thing that gets compromised needs to be recovered what does it cost to get up and running and make sure you have that plan in place and that plan is practiced by your teams so they can deliver recovery so we come back to the last uh, uh, governance activity here, which is evolution. Y you might find it daunting once you start comparing your organization to a standard of things that you have to have in place. Uh, you might find it daunting when you see the list of things that could be better. And like everything in a business, it could always be better. The question is just, how much does it cost to be better? And is that cost worth it to you? And so when you're looking at evolving your organization, um, what you need to do is, again, having identified what your risks are and identified the investment in protection and detection that you've got along those risks, hopefully you haven't had to respond or recover from anything. Have your teams be able to give you a relative understanding of where you're solid and where you're not. And the more time you spend talking about these kinds of issues, the more you're going to get your own comfort level about where we're solid and where we're not and what is the next thing that we could do uh, to make our organization better prepared uh, in case one of these risks happens so have a have a routine process here um, i mentioned cmmc that's a, a model that builds in maturity and evolution um, their uh, continuous improvement uh, controls inside that model, their continuous improvement practices at a low level say, we'll schedule them, right? Do them periodically. At a high level, they say, find ways to do them continuously. So if you don't have anything in place today, start with an annual review, start with a quarterly review. How often are we going to sit down and identify our risks and then expect to, to change the protections and detections we have in place? How often are we going to test our ability to respond and recover? so that we can see deficiencies in our ability to respond and recover and make uh, decisions to add investments to uh, improve those capabilities. So these are all business, right? These are all business activities. These are all management activities that, that you can do. And so like most things that you delegate, um, your process for doing these things is gonna be um, to decide what we're going to do, make sure you get informed by your teams and then make the resource allocation decisions that need to be made. Delegate the doing of the things and then inspect their results. It's really no more complex than that from a business management perspective. So hopefully that framework uh, is something that you could use at a, as, at a high level to think about the set of activities that your organization should be doing and then you can gather information uh, make the resource allocation decisions that need to be made. Make sure that there's a to-do list and you understand who's supposed to do the things and then inspect those results. Uh, if there are any questions, we can pause here. If not, we'll talk about a couple different um, common scenarios that are happening today uh, when it comes to um, when it comes to uh, cybersecurity. Yeah, I can. Uh, I do have a question here. Um, so, what percentage of an operating budget would you recommend company leadership set aside for the right amount of cybersecurity coverage? Oh, that's a that's a fantastic question, and answers um, are uh, all over the place, um, of course. So, you know, I hate to give you a dependent answer. What we can do is um, we can point you to some market research that talks about what uh, percentages. Uh, different organizations use. And if you could share with us what um, industry you're in, obviously they vary by industry, banking and finance, uh, defense, um, research and development organizations uh, might spend a little bit more than uh, other kinds of, of organizations. So um, understanding what industry you're in, uh, we'll do a little bit of research and, and get back to you on that. That's a terrific question. Okay, that is it for now. Excellent. All right, so um, let's talk uh, a little bit more about uh, how you would make some decisions and then go into a few examples. So when we look back at that cycle, we talked about identifying. So 
that identification activity should help you make decisions in a risk aware way. So the kinds of questions that you want to ask um, uh, of your of your uh, team or your vendors is, um, you know, what's going to happen if this bad thing occurs? Um, and understanding that you've got business goals that you're trying to deliver against with uh, with your business strategy helps you answer that question. Well, uh, we're not going to be able to execute this strategy if these bad things happen. Um, and that's a great way to help scale your decision making is by being aware of the risks that are associated with the investments. Um, talking a little bit about delegation and inspection. Um, Think about enforcing the right behaviors. So email is the most common way that organizations uh, get compromised. Uh, phishing at attacks or spear phishing attacks, which uh, our adversaries use because they work. Um, you can send emails in organization. You can make them look like they come from senior members of the organization. You can make them look like they come from vendors to the organization. I'm pretty sure I got one today that uh, um, is telling me that a Microsoft service that we use is uh, almost out of money and I need to uh, authorize paying up. Um, so, you know, that's an example of a, of a cyber attack that's really garden variety fraud. Uh, there isn't anything particularly techn technologically savvy about that attack. What is impressive about these attacks and one of the reasons why uh, they continue to persist is because um, like fraud, uh, the, the skill that you need to have is looking like the thing you're trying to emulate. So looking like an email that came from one of the senior people in the company, looking like an email that came from Microsoft. Um, and so because there's a lot of education that, that needs to take place, um, berating and embarrassing or scaring people inside your organization is not a great way to delegate out the responsibility for cybersecurity. Training, patience, um, positive reinforcement. Um, when people fail, let's say, phishing tests, we don't shame them, we train them. So when you're thinking about the delegation and the inspection, make sure you're thinking about this from a human perspective, right? As a leader in your organization, how do you manage change? How do you get people to give you the behaviors that you need? Um, and so, um, Make sure that you're you're managing your change in a positive way. And second big piece of advice, especially for business leaders, is do not exempt yourself from the rules, because some of these rules are going to change business processes. Um, implementing, let's say, even some easy uh, uh, protections like multi-factor authentication, where I log into my system and then I get emailed a code or texted a code, and I have to put a code in. Um, you know, that adds an extra step to your day. Uh, sometimes you'll discover that you've got things in your environment that are inherently unsafe. And, and so uh, you probably don't want to allow that kind of equipment in your environment. Don't, don't say that uh, nobody can use that stuff except you because your work is, is that much more difficult or complex than the work of the people on your team. Two reasons: one, it sends the wrong message to your team. Well, obviously, this isn't that important if the most, uh, you know, the most senior people in the organization aren't going to do it. And number two, attackers know this; <coughs> they know that senior team members are most often the ones who are going to be exempted, and they know that you're probably the the, the person in the company who has access to the most stuff, because as a senior leader in the organization, you need to be able to see all the reports, you need access to all the data, you need to be, be able to bring up all the contracts. You need to be able to do quality review of the work throughout the company. And so um, compromising you is probably the easiest way for them to get access to the things that they want access to. So uh, when you're reinforcing the right behaviors in your folks, uh, and there's a Wall Street Journal article, I believe recently that came out about the fact that fear doesn't work, uh, scaring people doesn't work. Um, so make sure you're using the right change management inside your organization and make sure that the rules apply to you and the rest of the senior leadership in the organization as well. So let's talk about some uh, common uh, scenarios today. Working from home. Working from home, uh, especially in 2020, has been one of the biggest security challenges uh, that we've all faced. 
especially because, of course, many of our, our operations have had to shift uh, to working from home, in some cases, almost 100%. And so how do we secure work at home? Um, so the, the, the purpose of this part of the presentation isn't necessarily to delve into the answers to all of these questions. And, and some of them, uh, I'd say the industry hasn't even worked out exactly what the answer should be yet. What I want to do is give you some ideas of how you would approach this from a business perspective uh, and a business leadership perspective, and not necessarily just a pure technology perspective. So let's talk about risks from working at home. Well, if we go around our circle, we start with identification. What are we trying to enable um, by allowing people to work from home? Uh, well, clearly, uh, for some workforces, this creates more productivity. It creates better quality of life. It, it gives people more flexibility. Um, and so uh, the first place to ask yourself is, is this just something that we're doing in order to get through COVID? Or is this a capability that we want to enable on a permanent or semi-permanent basis? Um, so we've got a clear business case as to why this is going to be valuable to, to allow. Uh, so what are some questions that we need to ask? Well, again, speaking from an identification perspective, what are the risks of working inside the home? Who has access to, to our devices? Um, how are we going to deal with uh, with um, home environments where someone might have roommates as opposed to family members. So can we trust the family members in the home versus uh, uh, people that our employees might not have uh, strong relationships with? How secure is that home and how secure is the information that's being saved uh, in that home? So uh, uh, it's fantastic that maybe I can do a lot of, of technological protections on a device. I can encrypt things. Uh, I can have remote administration that allows me to wipe those machines if they get compromised. Um, so I might be able to put some, some tools in place. What about printing? Are we going to allow people to print documents? Because a printed document is much harder to protect than a digital document. Um, and then there's an investment to be made in putting those protections in place. So. What do we think are going to be the best protections to uh, guard that information, guard the, the company proprietary information that happens to be now distributed across uh, a lot of homes? And is there an architecture that our technology partners uh, inside and outside the company can put in place uh, to increase the protection of data when that home user is connecting to the network? So should we be shifting to cloud services? where the security really exists in the cloud and every device uh, has a secure way or a more secure way, I should say, to connect uh, to that information. Um, what policies now as a business leader do I need to put in place to make sure those protections work? Um, so maybe I need a policy that says, don't just go to your personal computer uh, and work from that. Make sure you're working from your company laptop. Maybe I need to work out ways that um, to prevent my workforce from doing that, from using a personal computer, because a lot of them are inclined to do so. Uh, or maybe I didn't issue laptops to my workforce. Maybe they mostly work on desktops in the office. And so being able to work from home productively is going to require a different approach uh, because I don't, I don't have a workforce that's all carrying around laptops that's all working remotely. Um, so I can identify those risks. How is it that uh, my organization works. Do they have access to the tools that they need? Can we afford to put the tools that they need in their hands? And how important is it to us to enable this scenario? Uh, maybe not just as a as an emergency measure, but as something more permanent. Two, okay, tell me how we're going to protect this stuff. Right, as a, as a manager, that's a perfectly reasonable question for you to ask. What is it that we can do to protect this stuff? Um, if we're on a Microsoft infrastructure, what can Microsoft do to help me protect it? What can my vendors do to help me protect it? What can my workforce do to help me protect it? So now that it's protected, I probably have some business processes that I need to monitor, right? I, I've got some policies that I want to put in place. I need to educate my workforce on the behaviors they need to exhibit to make sure that the protections that we put in place work. Um, I have uh, some reporting that I need my people to do about those behaviors. 
once we've got that sorted out, how am I going to detect when something's going wrong? So what can we do to put in place uh, uh, sensors that can see the communication between these devices that are coming out of a home environment versus um, when they worked in the office? Am I worried about the type of internet connection they have? Am I worried about the other devices that they have in the house? Um, can I put a protection scheme in place that isolates that laptop from the rest of their home network? Uh, and then can I verify that those protections are being put in place, that people are turning on those protections when they work as opposed to trying to bypass them? And then can I watch that traffic to see if anything bad is happening on it? Uh, and then now we've made our way across the first half of that cycle. If I see something wrong, what am I going to do about it? Am I going to go seize that laptop? Am I going to require the employee to come in? What's my response plan uh, when we see bad uh, activity? And then how do I recover? In a, in a perfect world, I'm using the types of cloud technologies now in a home environment, in a work from home environment, that if something goes wrong with that machine, they can turn it in and I can hand them a new one and they reconnect to the network and they're on a machine that's clean. They're, they've got access to their data again. The turnaround time was very low. So in the event that that work from home scenario doesn't work out, what are we gonna do, right? Uh, and now you've got a set of behaviors that look like in some ways any other behavior, behavior that you're gonna be managing. I know what I'm looking for, or I know what I care about, I should say. I know how we're gonna do what I care about. I know how we're gonna, we're gonna watch for things going wrong. I know how we're gonna deal with it when things go wrong, and I know how we're gonna get back to work as normal. So uh, so there's a, a work from home scenario. Another place that uh, lots of people have questions today is also related with uh, employer or employee mobility. <clears throat> but what about these things? Um, how do we think about mobile devices? Um, most uh, uh, smartphones can now connect to enterprise resources. And a lot of times from a business perspective, this is fantastic because employees can work from wherever I can reach. Uh, reach them wherever they are. Um, I, they can execute lots of functions without having to be at their desk. Uh, creates a lot of pr productivity, creates a lot of flexibility. Um, what liabilities then come with that? How do I verify that those connections are good connections? How do I, again, I've identified some value. If I decide that that value is something that I want to enable, I've identified the risks associated with that. And I've asked my teams to tell me how to mitigate those risks. How are we going to protect the data that's on that phone? And now I can think about, well, if something goes wrong, right? The technology folks that I manage have told me, here's how we're going to protect it. Here's how we're going to see if something's going wrong. Now, what's the business cost of responding to an issue? If I allow most people to use their personal devices, which lots of organizations do to make these connections, and something goes wrong with that device, that device is compromised, how do I manage that? Am I gonna expect my employees who are connecting their network or their, their phone to, to our network and to corporate resources, if I need that device in an investigation, um, am I expecting them to turn it over? Are they willing to, to sign up for that policy? And uh, if they're not, how important now is it to us as an organization to enable this business capability? Should we buy iPhones for everyone? Are they going to be willing to carry two of them around? These are not complex technical issues. These are business management issues, right? So making these kinds of decisions is 100% within the scope of the kinds of decisions that as a business leader, you're probably making every day. Um, so count on your technology team to answer these questions about how am I going to protect this thing? How am I going to detect if something's going wrong with it? Do I have technology means to respond and recover if something goes wrong? But what are the policy implications? What are the business implications? What are the spending implications of enabling that capability? And how important is that capability to us as a business? Uh, so any questions here? And then we'll just wrap up with a couple of things that I would recommend uh, that you get from a provider, and then we can go into an open Q&A. Uh, Jess, do we have any other questions so far? 
Um, well, I think we have one here that's relevant. Um, a lot of CEOs and CFOs blindly put trust in their IT staff because, of course, they have the technical knowledge. So how do I know that we are buying the things we need? Um, I don't know what I don't know. I sure. Think. No, that, that's a great question. And and uh, I would encourage you to do a little bit more expo exploration of this, the, this uh, NIST cybersecurity framework with these five areas inside of it, because that'll give you a place to go uh, start asking questions. <clears throat> um, I, I think in terms of that blind trust, uh, it, it doesn't have to be blind um, if you are asking questions about publicly available frameworks. Uh, so I would recommend that you adopt one of those or ask your IT team what they're following. And if there's a lot of, you know, slipping and sliding in that answer, that's not an answer that would in, in, engender a lot of trust in, in me. Um, if I was the one asking that question. So there's frameworks out there um, because we do a lot of work as a, as a company with defense contractors. The CMMC framework um, is uh, one that, that I personally know a lot about and I think is very good. Uh, I think it's very good because it, uh, you know, it's got its, it's got its limitations. Don't, don't get me wrong. Um, but I think it's very good in that it really thinks about levels. And so if you're starting from nowhere uh, in terms of a, f a formality of what you're going to do as an organization, you can always say, OK, well, well, do we do the things that this model says is a level one, um, you know, a level one requirement? And there's an assessment guide. It's got specific questions that you can ask. And, um, you know, like most things that you manage where you might not be an expert in it, you probably know what a good answer looks like to a question as opposed to a lousy one. And so you don't want to hear yes, 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 yes. Uh, you want to hear, well, the the criteria for this is X, Y, and Z, and here's the things that we have in place that that do that. Um, as far as market research goes, uh, if you're, you know, when you when you do ultimately, as we all do, have to put some faith in the vendors of the the products that we purchase. Um, Gartner and uh, as an institution uh, does a lot of Forrester as well. They do a lot of reviews of of uh, products. And uh, they're getting more aware of the, you know, the the cybersecurity requirements of these products. Um, and uh, you know, any big software vendor today um, is certainly used to answering the question: How how do we secure things? Um, Microsoft, we're a Microsoft partner. Microsoft, as an organization, is spending billions of dollars on cybersecurity, uh, and I. While I couldn't, you know, give you statistics, I would be shocked if Amazon and Google weren't doing similar things. So pick a framework as a starting place or ask your teams what frameworks they're using. Uh, and then that framework will give you natural language, you know, non-technical views on uh, different things that you ought to be doing and um, give you questions that you can ask that should have specific answers. OK, that's all for now. OK, fantastic. All right, so a little bit more about that question. You know, what what should we expect from our providers? Um, because, you know, for, for smaller organizations and obviously different industries, that employee threshold varies when you think about revenue per employee. Um, it's it's hard to build a full in-house capability. Uh, it, it can be done, and if that's an investment that you want to make, certainly, uh, you know, getting the, the people in place that know these things isn't impossible. There's just a lot to be done. Um, so when you're talking to providers that help, um, they should care about what you do as a company, um, and they should understand the regulatory requirements that you're trying to manage too. So this goes back to the previous question too, even if you're talking to your in-house team, can your IT managers articulate what it is that you do as an organization? Um, and the risks that are associated with the things that you do as an organization and um, be able to uh, frame what it is that they're doing in response to those things that you want to do as a company. Um, security teams in larger organizations still to this day sometimes get branded as the organization of no. No, we can't do that. That isn't what an IT organization or a cybersecurity organization is supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be helping you mitigate the risks of executing your business strategy. Um, I, I say, especially if you don't have anything today uh, and you're not a, a very large organization that can put together its own 
specific list of criteria. Start with a regulatory uh, scheme that's already in the market. Um, I do recommend CMMC, uh, but it, it isn't necessarily perfect for all industries. Uh, and, and your provider should understand that, that regulatory environment, and that's a place for you to start having discussions with your providers, uh, again, whether they're external or in-house, um, about, well, here's a list of things that we ought to be doing across that spectrum of identifying, protecting, detecting, defending, responding, and evolving. Um, and um, that's a great place to, to start having those conversations. Um, again, the reason why I like CMMC is because it, have, it has multiple levels. Uh, CIS also, there's a, a scheme out there uh, from the Center for Internet Security that has multiple levels. Um, you know, pick a place to start. And in the, in the uh, framework of that evolve concept, um, once you put in place uh, some things and you know they're running, because remember, it isn't that we just turn them on. There's a business process that needs to take place. So once you put some things in place and you know they're running, sit down with the team and say, OK, what should we be doing next? What business capabilities are we trying to enable? And what do we need to, do, to know? What do we need to do to minimate, minimize the risks associated with those activities? And where, after we put this stuff in place that we already put in place and we got our business processes that are executing on the, these new capabilities that we have as an organization to protect and detect, where do we still feel like we're blind? Where do we still feel like we're exposed? If you can, if you can develop uh, that kind of relationship with those teams, then instead of blind trust, you're gonna have an ongoing conversation about what the business is trying to do, what the risks are associated with doing those things, and where they think they're strong and where they think they're not. And now you'll have a resourcing discussion about where you should go next and how you should make changes next. Let's talk about um, threat, right? Cybersecurity uh, and marketing competition are two places where uh, there are risks out there that are driven by other people who are trying to do better than you and, and sometimes I find it helpful to think about um, adversaries the same way that I would think back when I worked in customer relationship management, that I would think about competitors. It's just an organization that wants to be better than you at something. And so what do you do, right? How do you decide where to spend marketing or sales dollars? Well, you understand what your competitors are doing. You understand that, um, you know, as a hotel chain, um, people are trying to offer uh, different semi-luxury experiences. So they're coming up with new brands and they're uh, focusing them on business travelers. And is that going to erode into my market? Is that a risk I need to counter uh, with uh, my own version of that uh, sort of hotel chain? Are people making uh, responding to concerns about health? I'm, a, I'm in the, the consumer packaged goods uh, food business. And Competitors are, are, are developing uh, products in smaller packages that are sized to a, a calorie count um, to take that guesswork uh, out of the customer's hands and give them a product. To, is that something I need to respond to? Access to threat intelligence is really important in this because good threat intelligence will tell you, here's people who are coming after my industry are doing it this way. Hey, IT team. Hey, cybersecurity team, are we prepared to deal with this? Are we prepared to deal with these kinds of people coming at us this way? Because again, there's no such thing as secure or insecure. There's just how ready are you to respond to a particular kind of threat? So you want to make sure that your team has access to that information uh, and can use that information to, um, again, periodically at first, if you're getting started, quarterly, even once a year is better than not at all. Say, well, this is what the threat landscape looks like, and here's how we need to change what we're doing to respond to that threat landscape. And then, you know, it's very unlikely uh, if you're a smaller organization, and even if you're a larger organization, depending on how bad a day you, you have, um, for those respond and recover uh, activities, uh, you want to have that planned out, and you want to have access to the capabilities that you'll need if that happened. That, uh, remember, our goal is to minimize the likelihood of a cyber event and to recognize that one may happen anyway. And how do we fight through that event? How can we be a resilient organization that makes our way through that event? So um, line up 
help. Uh, there's some pretty large cyber events in the news right now, and uh, multiple companies in the FBI are involved in dealing with them. Um, you may not be that large of an organization, uh, but you're still going to want to know that the cavalry is coming, both from a legal perspective and from a technology perspective if something bad happens. So hopefully these recommendations uh, gave you some ideas about how to uh, continue to evolve your ability to manage this part of your business. I'm um, certainly happy to, I know we're at time here three, at three o'clock. If some people can stay on the line, happy to answer some questions. And if not, like just mentioned, we'll make sure we get those answers to you. Just is there anything else we want to try to squeeze in here? Yeah, we do have a couple of questions. Um, one is actually a reference to what you just said with some of the um, some of the incidents that are happening in the news right now. Um, so they bring up the the solar wind cyber incident. Yeah. And the question is, um, certain outlets painted like the most um, or like the worst attack we've ever faced. Others downplay it. So, in your opinion, how significant is this event? Uh, how so? Yeah, that's that's actually probably a better question for our CTO than uh, for myself. But. I, We've got several blog posts about this that I recommend you go you go check out. Um, how significant is the event? Uh, I, I think here's what I what I want to say about that. Um, the evidence that we've seen uh, through FireEye uh, and the reporting that they've done in the press um, and the uh, the level of the actors that are involved uh, in the response, the FBI, Microsoft, um, and the sophisticated the sophisticated techniques that FireEye has been publishing all indicate that the attacker is a very, very sophisticated attacker, right? And they're doing very sophisticated things. How significant is that? Well, um, you know, how significant is it to your organization probably depends on who you are and what you do um, and whether or not who you are and what you do is of interest to that sophisticated actor. Um, it, it, uh, and so that's where your threat intelligence comes in. Uh, how significant is it on a global stage? Uh, you know, we live in a world where um, this is how, how companies and countries compete now, right? We're in a world where physical, what the military will refer to as kinetic competition, uh, just doesn't happen. Uh, certainly not on a large scale anymore because as a species, we've gotten really, really good at it. Um, so where do we take our competition? Um, you know, we take our competition to markets. Um, certainly there's a lot of geopolitical, you know, diplomacy out there as well. And so, um, you know, the, the sophisticated capabilities to capture intelligence uh, is, a, is a requirement uh, to be a superpower or even a moderate power. And plenty of countries you know, want to be able to do this stuff. So uh, if, if it's a if it's an issue you're interested in getting on multiple perspectives on, I I recommend you follow our blog, uh, as our CTO has been publishing about it every couple of days and um, uh, doing some interviews in the press as well. All right, and then we're going to take just one more. Um, you mentioned CMMC, and uh, this question is, you know, with a new administration coming in, do you really think CMMC is going to continue? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I 100% think CMMC is going to continue. Uh, it you know it might shift a little bit. So two two perspectives on CMMC. Um, the DFARS rule change that has gone through that made it real. Um, so one that's passed and unmaking that rule isn't exactly trivial. Um, what that all is is a culmination of this uh, standard in this SP 80171. So if you look at CMMC level one, it mostly maps up with a particular FAR rule, and if you look at CMMC level three, it almost completely maps up with uh, NIST SP 80171. Um, so those are some regulatory frameworks for folks who aren't tracking CMMC that are out in the market. Uh, again, that I like and and I think um, is not a bad place to start trying to figure out what your cybersecurity plan should look like. So um, at a just at a at a you know philosophical level, and and I'm not uh, I don't want to start a political debate here. Generally, conservatives prefer market solutions and um, more uh, you know, uh, democratic uh, institutions, not democratic institutions of those that have democracy, but approach of the Democratic Party uh, and people on the left um, believe that the government has a responsibility to execute themselves, uh, execute their activities. Um, 
And so the debate that I've seen has nothing to do with whether or not we need to improve cybersecurity for defense contractors. There's no question that that has to happen. The question is how and what's going to be the accountability and assurance regime that gets put in place. CMMC, as considered under the uh, outgoing administration, was very much, uh, looked to me at least, like an attempt to create a market solution. There's third parties, the third parties do assessing, they have to follow guidelines and regulations that are laid out by the federal government, but the government itself isn't responsible for staffing up the uh, assessors that are gonna go out and make sure that everybody's doing the right thing. And the value proposition there for the industry and for us as a whole um, is much like the one that exists around public accounting. Let's have the government create a standards body. Let's set those standards. Let's hold uh, uh, people who participate in these activities to a certain standard of behavior, but let's let a, a market be creative of accountants uh, and firms that need accountants and organizations that consume accounting data. And you wind up with things like Dun & Bradstreet and CPAs and all that stuff, right? That's a very difficult thing for the government to create uh, entirely on their own. They need market forces to do that. The other side of the argument is, well, let's create government jobs, let's hire government resources, and let's have them go out and do those, uh, those assessments uh, and size up whether or not um, uh, whether or not uh, organizations that contract to the government are doing the right thing. And the value proposition there is we control it all. We don't have to worry about market forces that might not line up with what the government's intent is. Um, as long as we can get the appropriations in place, we as the government can make this happen exactly the way we want it to. Uh, so merits on both sides, not, not again, not making a political argument, but if you look at the DFARS rules that passed, um, in addition to putting CMMC in the regulations, they also put these basic medium and high assessments in the regulations. Those based directly on NIST 800-171, not inspired as CMMC is, um, and there's already an obligation to register uh, with a government database and report on your self-assessment against that score, and certain contracts are going to require you to um, get assessed by not yourself, but by the government. So either way, NIST 8, 800-171 is a standard that, that uh, contractors, government contractors are going to have to meet, and there's going to be an assessment. CMMC, that assessment's universal and from a third party, rolled out over the next five years um, under uh, DFARS uh, 7020 and 7019. Um, that assessment is done by every contractor on themselves with the option for the government to do that assessment. They're both based on largely the same set of controls, the same set of cybersecurity actions that you need to take as an organization. Um, so, you know, TLDR, yes, um, at a practical level, it's coming because you're going to have to do the same thing with the possibility or the light uh, uh, or the definite need for an inspection uh, at some point over the next five years. And um, CMMC has got some momentum and it's got a lot going for it. Uh, so some flavor of it's going to kind of persevere. What I don't think is going to stick around is purely self-assessment. There, there's too many people who need an independently verified understanding that as an organization, you have good cyber cyber hygiene in place, just like organizations want to know what your DUNS number is so they can look at your credit score. All right. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We hope the information we presented was valuable. Um, as I said in the beginning, we are recording this session and we will be sending in an email later with access to that recording and some other useful resources. Um, so be on the lookout for that. And please, everyone, um, have a safe and wonderful holiday. We will see you in the new year. Thank you all for joining.